slightly different to the evaluation contest. So it's five to seven minute speeches. So the green light will go on at five minutes, the amber light will go on at six minutes, and the red light will go on at seven minutes. So again, there will be disqualification if you go 30 seconds under, so under four minutes 30, or if you go over by 30 seconds, so seven minutes 30. So they'll just, the red light will go on and it will stay on for the remainder of the speech. And we'll just wait for Shan and Sophie to come back before we start the speeches. Yeah, oh, and the yeah. contest order, thank you Richard. The contest order will be Dennis speaking first, followed by Tendai. Followed by? Tendai. In your agenda. Tendai. Tendai. In your agenda. This week I've sent out an email with regards to the um, member subscriptions, so they just need to be renewed by the 15th of March please, so it's $90 for the next um, six months, so if you could just uh, send that through as soon as possible, that would be great, thank you. Contestant number one, Dennis Rye, with his speech titled Global Virtual Team. Global Virtual Team, Dennis Rye. How many of you in your current roles and in your previous roles have dealings with overseas offices and your overseas colleagues? Thank you, majority of us. And that's my today's topic, global virtual teams. Good morning, Toastmasters, fellow members and guests. What is global virtual teams? Geographically dispersed, they are located in different parts of the world. In general, you have a team who is working for the same goal, but for different locations. That's basically the, the global virtual team. What I'm gonna go through today is few advantages, disadvantages, and conclusion and my own opinion about global virtual teams. In regards to, sorry, I will start with disadvantages. So there, there are a few opportunities with um, global virtual teams. One of the big problems, so when, when the global virtual team concept started probably around mid 1990s, um, the companies were growing big time a bit with the help of technology and they started setting their offices around the world and there were major major problems for like big companies like IBM, um, HP and one of the main problems was the cultural diversity. It was very very difficult for the people to understand different cultures. I was going through one of the examples from, from a few rich research there was one Danish company who had outsourced their IT cons consulting to India. They were working on few projects. They started like it was just two months in, in the particular project and the Danish company and the management over there were absolutely getting annoyed with, with nothing being done from the consulting company based in India. In the end, they decided they're gonna call the entire team from India to, to 
Denmark. When they when the management started explaining them about what is the requirements, the, uh, the IT uh, firm, the Indian IT firm, they were nodding their hands and saying yes, yes. And just 10 minutes into the conversation, they realized that, hang on, there is something wrong over here. When they are saying yes and they're nodding their head, doesn't mean they're agreeing and understanding whatever our requirements are. So see, that's, that's the culture. So in India, when you are talking to someone, uh, and this is very basic, uh, it's, it's just a part of the acknowledgement, it's a culture. So they will not, they will not the head and say yes. So they're, they're just acknowledging of what they are saying. That doesn't mean that they are agreeing to what you are asking. See, so they straight away found the, found the problem and then they know how to deal with, with that Indian IT company. There are quite a lot of those examples. Like in my current role, we are dealing with, 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 with Japanese a lot. So Japan market is one of the biggest market for, for Fonterra, and they have a really high quality requirements. And, they have, and we have majority of our complaints, like the product related complaints comes from Japan. And sometimes when we see those, like they're a little scratch on the carton and they straight away want to reject that entire carton. And we say, oh, the product is fine. There is a little small, small scratch on the carton. But that's what the high quality requirement is from Japanese customers. And, and I absolutely support that because when we are selling our product, we have a really good reputation in the market. We, we don't want to spoil our reputation with sending those um, damaged cartons. So it's very, very important to maintain those, those high quality. And Japanese customers actually helping us to lift our own standards. So that's, mm. that's really good. So there, there are, yeah, th those are the disadvantages. The advantages of, of the global virtual teams is at the moment, everyone wants to, there's so much of competition, everyone wants to keep their operating costs low. So they can actually set up their, their like, you know, transactional customer service kind of roles somewhere in other, other part of the world where they can actually have a little bit of competitive cheap labor. Um, they can have the resource of building, which is gonna be very much less than any of the developing countries. It is, it is there, there are quite a lot of, so they, these are the basic two, advantages, but there are, there are lots of advantages. One of the other advan um, advantage is you can tap into the global talent. Just imagine if you, if you are running like a Fonterra from Auckland over here, what talent you're gonna attract from the prox proximity of like 30 kilometers area. I'm, I'm, I don't know if people from Hamilton is gonna come to work over here every day. So that's one of the big advantages. Like, you know, you can have a really high good talent and you can, you can have a really diverse team who can actually toss some good ideas from different parts of the world and come up with a really good solution which is gonna help the company to grow really faster. One of the examples is Amazon. They're growing big time at the moment. Like they were just initially when they started up, they were just focusing in, in US. They grew <coughs> rapidly. In order, in order for them to grow even, even 10 times more faster than what they were going in, in the first five years of their operation, they started going globally. And now look at them. They are the number one company in the world. The CEO of Amazon is, is sitting on $16 billion of his own net worth. That's a crazy amount of money. So in my opinion, definitely global virtual team is the way to go. It's gonna help to understand different culture. You can make good social norms and and you can, you can help the company grow and you can help your own self to grow as an individual. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Could we now have one minute of silence while the judges fill out their ballots?
would now like to welcome up our second contestant, Tendai Masamberg, with her speech titled, My Mother, My Hero. Tendai, My Mother, My Hero. <laughs> I stand here with pride and great, great gratitude for a woman who gave up everything, her dreams, the most valuable thing she ever owned, to make my dreams come true. I want us to hear fellow Tuscan members and our guests. I will tell you her story. She was born Judith Jireo Masamba, the father who had seven wives and 19 children. Her mother would be divorced early, and she struggled to find her own identity in that sea of children. To escape from it all, she would marry early in an effort to recreate a family she didn't have and find happiness. But that was never meant to be. You see, in Africa, you earn your way into the role of a matriarch. She would capture the pain of her early stages in her marriage through the names of her children. Our names tell a story. Names like Hamudiwamu, which means you don't like other people. Tofirei, what am I dying for here? To feel an eager for the benefit of everybody else except me. As she grew older, she would build the confidence. And you saw it coming in the defiance. Names like Sarudai, which means you can be selected, but I don't really care. <laughs> Parisai, you can be happy. And then she would lose a child in between. And then she looked up to the gods and say, remember me, Rangari Rai. As if she didn't have enough kids, she was now by child number 10. <laughs> she would name that one Ingizai, which means add more children. Like, her wealth and her happiness were never going to come from material things. It was always going to come from her children. To finish a very long production line, mm -hmm. 24 years, she was given babies. Wow. She had twins. She would name one of them Tafazwa, which means we are happy. And the other one Tendai, which means thank you. My memory of my mother when I was a child, I could see her working all the time. In the fields, working with the animals, or just around the house. She expected the same out of us. Would complain, Mom, this is too much. She would show you her hands. They were dirty, they were hard, and sometimes cracked. And she would say, these have served me well. And indeed, they did. Until the war came and wiped everything. War is a thief. It takes everything. Not just the material things, but people as well. She would lose a child through war, and there was a night when we knew she was meant to die that night. But you know when your time is not up, there is nothing a human person can do here. If God has not called you for that day, you'll find a way. You knew from the north it was government forces by the door. They were going for people whose children had joined the liberation wars and they would kill the parents. Yeah? As if my sister knew, she goes, Mommy, don't answer the call. Mommy, don't answer the call. She went to the door, diverted them. That night, my mom, my twin sister, Fadwa, and I crawled on our hands and fled away from our home. When we were far enough, she turned back and looked at our home and said, this is my home. Where do I go now? For five years, 
we never saw our home. When the war finished, the human capacity to survive and renew is amazing. Like an onion, she grew another layer that was thicker, that was strong, and recommitted to change a generation. My mother can't read, she can't write. All your kids can. She has four university graduates. She would sell all her cows. The only thing you get when your child is married. That's the most or the most valuable possession an African woman could ever have. Sold them all to give me this much. My mom is now 80. <laughs> She's frail. She's old. In the last year again, and alone, she has fallen twice working in the garden. Not because she has to, but because that's all she has ever only known. Work. <laughs> I want to look at her. And I say, let me love you. Let me take care of you. Let me repay you. Even though I know I'll never be able to pay enough. You are a mother. What sort of a mother are you? A father. You will be one one day. What type are you going to be? I look at my parent. I look at my mother. I look at my hero. <laughs>